present, Jeff Ward. Uh, note that you may submit questions for him using the Google Moderator link on the live page at any time. We'll address these questions during the Q&A at the end, and also feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the AltDevComp hashtag. Without further interruption, I'd like to turn it over to Jeff. Thank you very much, Heather, and I, I want to take the chance, uh, as many people have already, I think, to uh, thank Luke and Heather for putting this together. It's, I think it's a, a great resource, and I'm really happy to be taking part of it. Um, uh, as uh, Heather said, my name's Jeff Ward. I'm a senior programmer at Firehose Games, and Twitter and website handle are all there, um, and they'll be there at the end as well. Um, basically, this talk is, <coughs> of course, kind of a reference to, to this uh, um, quote from Donald Knuth that everybody uses to kind of justify the use of OOP or any real high-level language. Basically, he's saying that pre-optimization is the root of all evil, that 97% of circumstances, it's, it's not worth it, is basically what he's saying. And I'm not going to argue that he's wrong. I think he's absolutely right. Um, you know, what I'm going to try to argue is that kind of single-minded zealotry to OOP and, in fact, the way that it's commonly applied um, doesn't do anyone any good. And in fact, you're actually... Um, hurting yourself sometimes by just kind of thinking in an OOP mindset. Um, so to start, I want to talk about two great rules from this book. This is um, a really, really great book that I recommend you read from two of the best um, C++ programmers in the business. Um, and it's just a set of kind of rules and standards that you should follow when doing C++ programming. And the first rule lines up with Knuth's quote, which is essentially don't optimize prematurely. You know, it's far easier to make a correct program fast than a fast program correct. So by default, you should not focus on making code fast. Fo focus first on making code as clear and readable as possible. Um, but they found it important enough that the exact next rule is don't pessimize prematurely. Maturely, and I love the pessimization. Um, all things being equal, they say notably that code complexity and readability, uh, certain efficient design patterns and coding idioms, should we should just use them all the time, um, uh, and that you shouldn't kind of use systems that you know won't perform well um, when there's no obviously there's no benefit um, to using them. Two things of note here is that um, what's mentioned is things being correct, readable, maintainable, and fast. And of course, correct, readable, and maintainable are much, much, much more important than fast, but fast should always kind of be in the back of your mind. And what, what isn't mentioned is kind of speed of development. Um, it turns out that over the long term, and most people that do OOP or any other form of programming will tell you that speed of development actually comes from the, the first three of these others, correct, uh, readable, and maintainable. Um, fast is just something that's really nice to have, especially in game development. Um, it's often the mistake that OOPers get into because, you know, it's such so gosh darn easy to kind of just try to make things really, really, really fast. And you're sacrificing initial velocity, kind of getting things up and running quickly for eventual velocity down the line, um, where you end up accidentally kind of making systems that are really, really hard to expand upon. Um, now, you know, object-oriented programming is interesting because, you know, I think that a lot of reason a lot of people kind of grasp onto it is because we really, really like to think in objects, right? You know, we like to think of a car, a truck is a car, right? Uh, and it has wheels. We like to think in these is and has a relationships. We like to think that a tiger is a cat. But uh, if you live in the south of the United States, you know that, that calling a truck a car is an insult to the truck. And certainly call, calling a tiger a cat, you know, as, nice, as easy it is, as it is to say, um, it, you know, it's kind of an insult to, to, the, to the tiger. Um, so that's the argument for OOP is that OOP is just good design. By virtue of being object-oriented programming, by virtue of being object-oriented, you're making things easier to understand and easier to read and easier to maintain. Um, and using these the OOP patterns, you're creating good design, but it's not necessarily true, right? It, we get into this, this thought process of, because I understand the objects as a whole, I understand that uh, then this is easier to, to maintain as a program. Um, in my opinion, the principles of design are important, not the paradigm. That in any paradigm, be it OOP or functional programming or, or um, any other type of programming, procedural programming, um, 
the principles of the design of how you design are important, not the paradigm that you're actually using. And the tenets of good design, I think, are the key. Interestingly, you know, being uh, correct, simple, and clear, uh, being flexible, not rigid, having things encapsulated and self-contained, and mobile so they have little or no coupling. Um, I think that of all of these, this is the one, mobile, um, and having little to no coupling, is the one that's violated the most often because it's the easiest to put in. It's very, very easy to put in coupling between two systems, and it's really easy to spot, and it's really, really hard to remove. Once two systems are coupled, it's almost impossible to decouple them in a lot of circumstances. So um, what's interesting is that, that it turns out that these tenants are actually from design patterns. They're actually from the principles that are put down in design patterns for a good design pattern in OOP. When the creators of design patterns talk about what makes a good design pattern um, and what makes a well-constructed program, they're not wrong. It's just important to recognize that these principles are independent of object-oriented programming, and you can violate them often using the patterns that they've set down. Um, two patterns in particular that I love to kind of rail on because they're so easy to rail on, the singleton and the visitor. The singleton's the most easy um, because people mistake it as a behavioral pattern. It's a construction pattern to limit the number of things of, of a given object available. It's a factory pattern, technically. But the thing is, is that when you're using singleton, it's basically just another name for a global object and global data. And a lot of people tend to think, well, I'm being object-oriented, my singleton is encapsulated, so therefore I've made good design, and that's incorrect. The more of these you add, kind of the more times you call class colon, colon instance, the harder it is to remove the singleton or replace it in the future. It, this is a classic example of increasing initial velocity and cost of future velocity. Um, common culprits in games are loaders, uh, input managers, anything with manager at the end of it, and application. Application is the one I tended to use um, and have since uh, come to really hate. Um, you've probably used them too. It's just so easy to use them that you just you tend to use it. And it's not until the end of kind of working with them that you realize maybe I shouldn't have done that. Um, one of the really interesting things is over the long term, what's, uh, if you do unit testing, this actually does a really, really good job of showing you exactly where your coupling is. Because what happens is when you write your first unit test, you know, you create, you have a mesh called create. It's a factory pattern, right? And, you know, you just want to check to see that it's null. Okay, I created it correctly. Okay, but now I want to make sure that it calls out to the loader to get that. So you have to initialize your loader, but now how do you test that the loader got called? Or now if you want to, you know, your mesh has to create textures, right? It has to call out to the texture manager. So you have to, you know, make sure you initialize all of these things. And, and now you still don't know how to test it. Now one of the uh, interesting things is that first unit test now has to change because you've created these dependencies. And this is why unit tests are really, really good at exposing these dependencies because every time you have to go back, you have to initialize something new. It's a pain in the butt. Um, uh, one way around this usually is to kind of make all of your uh, singletons actually interfaces that are held on one central singleton. It doesn't get around the fact that you still have to initialize every single uh, different singleton or different manager that's needed by the mesh manager, by the mesh, um, but it does make testing a little bit easier and sometimes can disguise that. Um, visitor is the other one that I'm kind of uh, against. Um, there's nothing wrong with it in theory. The idea is that you have a class that has state that has to visit a bunch of other um, classes and their children. Um, in practice, though, everybody names the function from the visitor visit, which is correct according to the pattern. Uh, but it doesn't tell me anything about what the visitor does. In fact, the class name tells me more. Um, but in the context of the object that's calling it, it's always calling it through the interface. So when I see a function that's enumerating all it and all of its children and calling visit, it doesn't help me understand kind of under, under what circumstances this is called. Um, it, it, it turns out you can do this in a lot of different ways that aren't object-oriented, not the least of which is just a simple for each loop. You know, what I understand about visitor is this is basically what it is, except it doesn't necessarily understand the internal workings of any given object. But you still have to call it on the concrete object that you have, unless it has some weird <laughs> internal state that you don't know. Um, I've seen many instances where people already know the object that they're holding on to and all of its children and still will call through a visitor, which doesn't make any sense, um, versus this kind of, you know, 
you're adding this level of abstraction which doesn't necessarily get you anything. Um, for loops tend to perform better, especially in C and C++, and especially in cases of objects held in full arrays. They're simpler to understand and read because I can see all of the dependencies in a single loop rather than having to go through various um, different classes and different interfaces to understand all the dependencies that are there. Um, they're simpler to, like I said, uh, immediately see the dependencies. The problem is, is they require a lot of forethought. You have to it doesn't seem like it, but they do actually require that you think about how you're holding your data in order for them to perform efficiently. Um, but then they're decidedly not OOP. Um, one thing we tend to, to lose uh, when we're talking about programming is that programming programs actually like to operate on small sets of data. Um, this has been the case for a long time, and it hasn't really changed. Computer science started as math. The concept of a function is the same as a math function. You take a set of data, run it through a function, and it returns uh, modified data. Um, when we lose sight of this, which we do in OOP, um, we start to have some interesting problems. Um, in OOP, I mean, in its purest form, object.method is just a rebinding of function with, the, with a pointer to the object passed as the first parameter. Even in virtual functions, this is the case. It's just it can do dynamic binding to figure out which version of that function to call. Um, we just frequently lose sight of what's happening because OOP trains us to lose sight of this. Uh, it also turns out that computers really, really like it when data is set up in line so they can just run the same function on lots of the data. And you might think, oh, this is an old school kind of way of thinking, an old school way of programming. But no, it's not. In, in fact, in modern computers, um, this runs faster. Um, and the reason is because uh, in high performance al applications, uh, even on modern computers, cache lines tend to refresh fairly slowly. Uh, and being able to preload the cache is super nice. It tells the computer kind of what's coming. Um, also, uh, by the way, optimizing for this is something that's really, really hard for a compiler to do. It's easy for a user to do because they know how, if they know how the data is about to be used. Uh, but the compiler can't. Um, and in, uh, this is the way most of us don't design, and almost no person working in full OOP thinks this way. In fact, they tend to think this way. Um, it's harder for the computer when dealing with objects. Even if we're only operating on a small set of data in the function, the function has to pull down the entire object. Um, and this would still be better if we were doing it. It's not great, but it's still better. But we tend not to hold objects in line in OOP. We tend to separate them from memory. They get, they get pulled from random locations in memory. And then from a cache line perspective, this is the worst possible thing you can do. Uh, but it gets even worse, because in most OOP, you don't know when you're going to get a virtual function hit. So you can't even assume that you're using the exact same function. And in fact, this virtual function hit is impossible for the compiler to run across. In the original version of this talk, I had this whole section about um, just how bad virtual functions are. It turns out that the compiler, in most circumstances, can sometimes optimize away complete function calls unless they're virtual. In the case of a virtual function, it has to call that function on the off chance that it is something that's required and has side effects. Um, in the case where it's not a non-virtual function, sometimes the compiler can look at that and say it has no effect, and therefore it'll be no opt. The part of the problem here is we're frequently thinking in terms of real-world objects or on-screen objects. We think of the car and the truck and the cat and the tiger. We don't think about the smaller functional elements that make these things up. We don't have, the, we don't have a class for an engine or a wheel or teeth or claws. Right? These are the smaller functional elements that make things up. There's a common way of looking, in contrast, when we think in terms of the functional aspects of a thing, we get closer to data-oriented design. Um, in each case, each one of these can be used, each one of the components can be used separately, um, which makes them highly mobile and decoupled from each other. Um, if we go a step further and actually think in terms of uh, what sets of these components will need to be updated together, now we're actually thinking the way the computer wants to see things. Uh, this is more reusable, it's more maintainable. This is not premature optimization, but this is avoiding premature pessimization. This actually matches up with the book best practices. Um, one, uh, one best practice we frequently think about but don't really kind of understand um, is rule five in this book, which is give one entity one cohesive responsibility, right? 
in C++ coding standards, they're talking about any given entity, be it a namespace, a library, or a class. Um, and it's just a good way of doing class design. It also lines up uh, with The Pragmatic Programmer as well, another book I totally recommend reading. That late, uh, lines up with the drive principle, which says, you know, every piece of knowledge must have a single, uh, unambiguous, authoritative representation within a system. It's called the drive principle because they're basically saying, don't repeat yourself. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one of the problems is that in effort to be dry in OOP, sometimes you run into what I call, like to call the dry OOP trap. Um, and I've seen this happen frequently. I see it happen all the time. When you're using co a lot of complex objects in a, in a complex object hierarchy, where you're thinking of not the functional aspects, but of the object as a whole, as it would like appear on screen. When you have two objects that uh, you know share a set of code in an effort to be dry, um, people will create an abstract base class to reuse the code. Already, you're ca you've caused yourself a, pro yourself a problem. In the book Coding Standards, uh, one of the tips is uh, that inheritance is substitutability. You should inherit not to reuse code, but for a, an object to be reused. Inheritance is a specialization of a system that needs to be replaced, not a way to reuse code. Just by doing this, your derived class, by definition, now has multiple responsibilities. It's abstract responsibility and it's derived responsibility. Um, what you're actually looking, for, looking at is a set of shared functionality. Um, that is likely to be needed somewhere else in the future. So what happens when you need that code again? Well, there are usually three options that I see. The first is to move it up into the inheritance tree again um, to the closest place you can find uh, that's a common ancestor of, the, of, of all the uh, pieces that need this piece of code, regardless of every, if everything else down the inheritance tree needs it. The other option is you move it out into a new component. Um, you take that piece of functionality, you make a new class that's not part of the inheritance tree, and, you, and um, your previous classes contain this class. Um, and the third is that you just kind of ignore the dry principle and you just duplicate the code. Um, in practice, I usually only see the, the first one and the last one. Um, because people are thinking in OOP mindsets, they think that moving things up the inheritance tree are good, or if they're under crunch, so this happens in the last... Um, portion of a project, they'll just duplicate the code, and they'll say, well, it's bad, but I'm at the, the end of this product cycle anyway, so I'll just duplicate the code, um, which can and has been a maintenance nightmare for me in the past. In reality, I think the middle one is the best option, but it does require that you have an architecture that you've thought about the situations where you'd be able or want to move things out into new components. In terms of the maintainability of OOP, OOP is only maintainable if you think of the principles of design. Uh, the principles of design are frequently ignored if you think of objects as self-contained wholes instead of the pieces of functionality which make them up. So you should really think of the functionality regardless of whether you're going to work in an OOP mindset or not. Um, in, in reality, you're sacrificing performance for the illusion of maintainability. You're prematurely pessimizing um, as a result of thinking that you're creating a good encapsulated whole when you're not. The principles of design are important, not the paradigm you decide to work in. The tenets of good design are to be correct, simple, and clear, flexible and not rigid, encapsulated and self-contained, and mobile so that it has little or no coupling to other systems. Um, it turns out I'm not completely against the OOP, as I've said. These are from the the the, uh, the site design patterns. Um, you just need to think about whether or not uh, you're thinking of things in terms of on-screen objects and writing your OOP that way, or whether or not you're actually thinking as a coder and as a, as the computer thinks. And I can take questions. I went through that fast. I apologize if I went through that a little bit too fast. Nope, looks good. Uh, thanks so much, and we'll, we'll just transition right into questions. Uh, the first question we have is, would the purpose of the visitor pattern be more suitable in enterprise programming, where the actual objects or code may be used remotely, or is it more that visitor is being used where it's not needed? It's a combination of both. So I, I agree in both cases. Um, I, I've seen it used in a lot of cases where 
um, it's not needed at all. And then uh, there is cases in enterprise patterns where, um, first of all, the visitor has to keep uh, state, which is the one thing that I mentioned, um, that that's actually acceptable. The other is when uh, the visitor doesn't understand anything at all about its underlying, about what it's about to be called on. Um, this is very rare. Um, and it happens more often in things like Java, where you have dynamic binding of classes. Um, it's, it, yeah, it, it, and, and I kind of, and I always find those to be a maintainable, like people will argue that they're, they're a good idea um, because they're more maintainable because now I can replace that with anything that I want, blah, 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 um, and Swing and, and, and Java things like that are nice, but I always find them horribly hard to parse. Um, they're easy to replace portions of, but when you're trying to debug and figure out what's actually going on, I always find them very, very, very difficult. And maybe that's a thing with me. Um, but again, I find, especially in game programming, I actually find that, that using Visitor 90% of the time you're overthinking the problem. Um, because you very rarely are dynamically binding classes and pushing them through uh, sets of objects where you have no idea what the object that's being held is. Um, it's just very, very rare to see that. Uh, it does happen in Enterprise a little bit more. All right. Uh, it looks like that was the only question we've received. So um, I don't know if you have any like closing pointers that you'd like to, to include as well. Uh, so I talked a little bit about kind of the performance of OOP. I have a whole, the original way I, I wrote uh, this was um, it, it's, well, it was an hour long, so I had to cut it down a bunch, and I talked a little bit about performance aspects. But there were, um, you'd be surprised at how often just simple things caused huge performance problems in, in object-oriented programming. Um, virtual functions especially, are um, really, really nasty. They, have, they incur automatically just incur a um, piece of overhead from having to, from the vtable hit. And then on top of that, uh, the um, compiler can't optimize them away. Um, and virtual functions are kind of the main big thing that are available, available to you as a, uh, uh, using OOP. Um, in addition, I think we also like, and this is often used as an example of good coding in, in game programming, is the game object pattern, where you have one object which is off of which every game object in your game inherits. Um, and I think as an initial kind of way to get into things, it's not bad. Um, but you need to realize that down the line, it ends up being, you know, you end up having this ubiquitous game object that has tons of code in it that's not used by 90% of your objects just because you did exactly what I was telling, was saying in the past. You've got this these pieces of shared code um, that just had no other good place, essentially. Um, and I've seen that happen many, 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 many times. Um, whereas if starting with a component pattern, which is actually if you use, if you've used Unity, it's how we, how it wants you to code, is to think about the components that are on an object, not uh, every object as an object um, in in uh, OOP form. Uh, uh, thinking in terms of components is nicer, I find. Oh, we do actually have a question about components. In a component mm -hmm. system, what is the best way to deal with intercomponent communication, such as a graphics component needing to in, needing information from the physics component, for instance? There's a few ways to do that. Um, the easiest way, uh, so you know, generally you don't want to have uh, a, something like a graphics component grabbing information from a physics component. Instead, you would have a position component, which so tells everything where it is. Um, and then you can, and then there's no problem really coupling that graphics component to the position component. It's going to need it. Um, and there's no problem coupling the, the position component to the physics component because they, that, they need that piece of information. Um, the other option is to just look at those as sets of data uh, and have a system that, that reads the information out of those components as needed. And then, therefore, those components are reusable and then the system can, can be replaced as needed. Um, that's a, 
it's a kind of it works really well. It's really actually if you kind of worked in OOP for a long time, uh, it's called Entity with Code and Systems is kind of hard to wrap your head around sometimes, but it's an op optional other way to do it. Um, the third way is with message passing. I don't recommend it. Um, uh, messages break the chain of, of, of call, break the call stack. Um, they're really, really good in a lot of circumstances, but for querying for data, they're really, they're not great unless you're doing um, an MMO or uh, some other networked layer um, where you may have to send a message to, to something across the network in order to query the information out. Okay, and uh, one last question. Um, how would you solve dependency in singleton managers? I got this question when I gave a dry run of this talk. Um, there's a f You have to think about um, whether or not that manager is actually necessary. Uh, a good example, the example that I gave that I could actually come up with a really good um, thing for was uh, a mesh loader. Um, where the mesh goes to load itself and then it notices it has a bunch of other dependencies. Um, the nice way to do that would be to actually pass in, you know, a list that can be modified that just uh, is just a list of strings and it just pushes every single thing that it needs that it's dependent on onto that list of strings. And the loader loads the mesh, grabs the list of strings, load every loads everything else, and then pass it, passes all of those resources back to the mesh saying, here they are. Um, the one that's a little bit harder is is sound. Um, when you have a, a lot, in a lot of cases, and even our uh, sound guy just uses you know sound manager dot instance stop play sound, um, which is by far the easiest way to do it, um, but definitely couples everything to the sound manager. Um, there is a, a there's a message passing possibility there, and then there's also you can query each object saying uh, at the end of it saying hey what type of, do you need to play a sound this frame? If so, what is it? Um, both of those work, um, and it just comes down to kind of personal programming preference. Um, generally, the idea is just kind of look for places. It's like, what? why do I actually need to call out to the singleton? Is there a way for it to get that information without coupling these two, uh, these two systems together directly? Ah, thank you. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff, and thank you all for joining us. We have some more sessions. Uh, the first uh, showcase is coming up next, and uh, more sh sessions throughout the day. Check the Watch Live page. Uh, thank you, Jeff, and thank you all for attending. Thank you.